chapter 3. We're going to look just at one verse. If you're able to stand in the reading of God's Word, we ask you to do so. Verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. May God now receive a blessing upon the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. Now I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, know that February is love month. And men, just a reminder, Valentine's Day is just around the corner. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but last year in America, we spent $21.6 billion, that's right, $21.6 billion on Valentine gifts, cards, candy, flowers, and etc. And you know, as unique and as important and special as human love is to all of us, there is a greater love, and that is the love of God. Amen. The love of God through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not sure, really, if we can comprehend how much God loves us. I'm not sure we can even comprehend the love of God with our human minds. But I want to take you over reading out the NIV to a verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. And in the Old and New King James, it's bestowed. And I like that word, lavished. Look at that word lavish. That word means an outpouring. That word means gone overboard. It means gone far beyond anything that we can expect. Now, I'm going to try to illustrate this love for you, but I take no credit for this. I'm going to borrow the illustration used by Dr. Graves at General Assembly and at our wives and ministers retreat. Now, take a look at this picture. Now, I want you to imagine, if you will, that dirt being the love of God. Can you imagine that truck full of God's love coming and backing up to you and dumping God's love on you? And then that truck leaves and God brings another truckload of love and another truckload of love and another truckload of love. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be enough love for me, would it not? But I want to tell you this morning, you all, God's love is even greater than that. Imagine that truck full of God's love. Backing up and God pouring his love out on you. Pulling away in another truck and another truck and another truck and another truck. God pouring out his divine love on you. My friends, that is the love of God. And the Bible reveals to us exactly how much God loves us. And it's found in one of my favorite verses over in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, for God so loved you, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that, my friends, that is the depth, the width, and the length of God's <coughs> love. You know, it wasn't long ago that we uh, celebrated Christmas. Uh, maybe some of you still had your Christmas tree up. I don't know. But today I want to talk about another tree. Another tree that we celebrate, and that is the old rugged cross. Amen. Because see, the cradle 
and the cross are woven together. You can't have one without the other. You have to have the birth of Jesus at Christmas and Calvary's cross combined together as one. And as great as human love is, there's no greater love than the love of God through Jesus upon the cross. And this morning, I want to share with you four biblical truths out of this one verse. Four biblical truths that reveal to you and I how much God really loves us and how he continues day by day to pour out that love to us. First of all, God revealed his love on the cross through a substitutionary purpose of the cross. Look at the cross. Take a look at it. When I walked in here this morning, that was the first thing that I saw. What do you see when you look at the cross? I don't know about you, but I look at the cross, something in here. It, it begins to move. Something in here begins to swell up with praise and worship from my heart. Something begins to flow from here. Because when I look at the cross, I don't see a cross. I see Jesus. I see the Lamb of God hanging there on the cross. I see Jesus who died for my sins. I see Jesus who died for your sins. I see Jesus who took my place and who took your place upon the cross. Now, go back and look at the first part of that verse. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust. Now, note here, the just being Jesus. The unjust is us. Now, the Bible is very clear. I don't care what anybody writes or anybody says. God forgives sin. Amen. But the question is, how does God do that? He does that through a substitute. Someone had to be a substitute for our sins. Someone had to... Pay the penalty for our sins. Listen, God cannot overlook sin. If God overlooked sin, he would no longer be a holy God. No more than a righteous judge would not be a righteous judge if he overlooked sin, I mean crime. God cannot overlook sin. Sin must be punished. If God does, he'll fall from the throne of grace. Now, if I was to go around here this morning, I was to ask you, give me one word that describes God. Now, I know there's not one word to describe God. But if I was to ask you, let's narrow it down, what is the most important two words that describe God? I believe outside of love, it's holiness. Because God is a holy God. The Bible declares, holy, holy, holy is the God Almighty. And because God is a holy, righteous God, sin <coughs> must be punished. God cannot and will not overlook sin. So God, he had to come up with a plan. He had to come up with a way in order for him to punish sin and have sins forgiven. Did you know, according to the Bible, we're sinful from birth? Actually, I think we're sinful from the moment that we're conceived in the mother's womb. So God, out of his love for you and I, mankind, he had in his heart... He had in his mind a plan in which he could punish sin and bring forgiveness to the sinner. And that method was through a substitute. The Old Testament <coughs> prophesied about the birth, the death, and resurrection and the second coming of Jesus Christ, all the way through the Old Testament. But I want to take your mind back to a man in the Old Testament named Abraham. 
Abraham was father of the Jewish nation. God came to Abraham one day and said, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9, he said, Abraham, he said, I'm going to give you a son. This son is going to be a part of your lineage. He is going to be a blessing to nation after nation after nation to come. He says, we're going to call his name Isaac. He's going to be born of a miracle. Now, I know, Abraham, you're 100 years old. I know that your wife cannot have, Sarah can't have a child. But I'm going to tell you, Abraham, through the divine power of God, she is going to conceive in her womb and have a child. And you're going to name that child Isaac. And he will bless all nations. Isaac here is a picture of an Old Testament prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I am sure that Abraham, at the age of 100, was on top of the world. I'm 61. I don't know where I would be if I was told I was going to have a child. <laughs> but he's on top of the world. He had his beloved son that he loved. We love our children, do we not? No matter what. And God comes to him in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through verse 14. And he says, Abraham, see that son over there that you love? I want you to take him. And I will show you the place where to go. And there I want you to offer him up as a burnt sacrifice. Now I'm sure Abraham probably didn't understand it. But... He knew that he had to be obedient to God. They come to the place that God instructed them. On Mount Moriah. It is the same place that the temple would later be built. Isaac, he has the wood on his back. And as he started up Mount Calvary, just as Jesus had the cross on his back as he started up the old rugged hill, Abraham had a burning torch in his hand that speaks of God's wrath on sin. He had a knife in his hand which speaks of the penalty of sin and the wages of death. Now try to picture this. There they are. They're, they're going up the mountain. And I'm going to paraphrase here because I wasn't there, but I can just see Isaac going, hey, Dad. Dad was probably walking a little bit ahead of him. And he taps him on the shoulder again, hey, Dad. You go, Dad, I, I see the wood. I, I see the knife. And I see the fire. But God, where's the sacrifice? Now I can see the tears, can't you? As Abraham choked back his emotions. But then he made one of the greatest statements in all of the Word of God. He said, my son, God will provide. Amen. God will provide. They get up to the top of the hill. Isaac reaches his hands out and he allows his father to bind him. Do we put him on the altar? Now understand, Isaac is a hundred. I mean, I'm sorry, Abraham's a hundred. Isaac is a young, strapping young man. I'm sure that he probably could have overtook him. But he did. He stretched out his hand and he said, Father, not my will, but thy will. Wow. What's that take your mind to? Back to John 10.10. 10. Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down myself. Here is Isaac submitting to the will of his father. Just as Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane submitted to his father. Abraham takes the knife. Picture this. Being obedient to God, knowing that that was the son that he loved. He takes the knife just as God instructed him. Being obedient, he goes to pierce that into his side. And then in Genesis chapter 22, verse 11 through 13, an angel speaks to him. He says, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on your son. And Abraham lifts up his eyes and he looks over. 
And he sees a ram caught in the thicket, and he goes and he gets the ram, and there he offers the ram for the burnt offering instead of his son. By faith, Abraham learned the lesson of substitution. The ram became a substitution for his son Isaac. And he named the place there, God will provide. Now let's move forward to the day of the crucifixion. It was on a Friday. They nailed Jesus to the cross. There he became our substitute. There he became our sacrificial lamb for our sins. The lamb of God hung there on the cross. And John tells us over in John chapter 19, verse 30, he was full of blood and suffering. And in the midst of all of it, he bowed his head and he said, it is finished. It is finished. The just being Jesus became the unjust the sinners, you and I. Now, I want you to try to picture this. Pilate and Barabbas are down on the bottom of the hill looking up. Can't you see Pilate saying, Barabbas, you're a lucky man today. You're wicked. You're evil. You're a criminal. I wanted to crucify you on that cross. Barabbas, Barabbas, look up there on that hill. See that man in that middle cross, Barabbas? I couldn't wait to put you there. But you're going to go free today. See that man up there? I don't know who he is. But he is dying in your place. Jesus, through God's great love for us, he became the substitute on Calvary's cross. The substitute for my sins and the substitute for your sins. But there's a second thing I want us to see about God's great love upon the cross. And that is the suffering passion of the cross. Look again at our verse. For Christ also suffered once for sins. That word passion means suffering to endure. Now, I'm not sure we'll ever be able to understand the suffering that Jesus endured upon the cross. I don't believe today there is a song that can ever be sung to express it. I don't think there's a pen that can ever write it. I don't think there's a human heart that can ever understand the suffering that Jesus Christ suffered upon the cross because he loved us. And he became our substitute. But I want to paint a picture in your mind of three ways that he suffered. I want you to grasp hold of this because I believe if you grasp hold of this you'll come to a full understanding of the price that he paid for my sins and your sins. Number one, he suffered on the cross emotionally. In Luke chapter 22, verse 41 through verse 44, remember there he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew that he was facing the cross. He says in this verse, and he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, I want you to understand this in your mind. As he was praying there that day in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying earnestly. He was praying to his father. And scripture says he prayed so hard that the blood drops come out of his forehead. I want you to understand this. He was in so much agony on the cross. The blood did not ooze out. It was dropping to the ground because he knew what was ahead of him. 
See, Jesus here, he wasn't battling the Father. He wasn't even battling Satan. He was battling his own humanity. He says, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, I believe there's a word that we often overlook in this. And that word is cup. Jesus had to drink from the cup. Well, maybe you're saying, well, preacher, what was in that cup? Now, I can start over here with Miss Kim, and I can pass that cup around. <laughs> and as that cup is being passed around, we can put in there every dirty thought, every foul word, every self-esteem, every lie, every deed of deception, every sinfulness, every wickedness. <coughs> and we can place that <coughs> into that cup. We can go all the way back to the time of Adam and Eve. And we can go forward all the way to where the trumpet blows. And we can pass that cup. And corruption and deception and abortion and rape and arson and drug addiction and demon <coughs> worship and violence and wicked and filth will be put in that cup. See, Jesus knew that he was going to be the substitute for what was in that cup. He knew that he was going to be the substitute for the sins of the world. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness, the righteousness of God in him. So God revealed his love to us on the cross through the emotional suffering of Jesus, but also through his physical suffering. In John chapter 19, verse 1, it says that Pilate rushed around in his mind. He was, the, the people wanted to get rid of Jesus, and, and he wanted to get Jesus off of his hand. And he thought if they could have him physically be, that would satisfy the people. In John chapter 19, verse 1, it says, So Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Now, you need to understand what scourging is. <laughs> To understand the physical pain that Jesus endured for us. They tied his hands above his head to a post. They stripped him of his clothes and they whipped him with leather straps. On the end of the leather straps were told were bone, glass, lead, and metal. There were two people. Follow me. One would start at the throat and work the way down from the front. Another will be in the back and start at the feet and work their way all the way up to the top. And every time the whip caught his flesh, it pulled the human flesh from his body. And I want you to know something. These people were experts. They knew exactly how to do it. Then he went through six mock trials, travesty of justice. They pulled the beer from his face. They hit him with their fists. They beat him with clubs. They mocked him. They slapped and spit in his face. They jammed the crown of thorns down on his head and blood flowed down his face. They tied him to a cross and they made him carry that cross to Calvary. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And when they got to Calvary, they stripped him out of the cross. And there they nailed him to the cross. Now there's one part of this that is not in the Bible, but writers tell us. You had to dig a hole to put the cross in. So when they picked Jesus up, they dropped him into the hole. And the cross jarred his body once again. Can you imagine in your human mind today the pain that must have went through his hands and feet? Can you imagine his throat being filled with blood? He couldn't be breathed. The agony of his suffering was far beyond anything that we could ever comprehend in our own minds. Maybe you're saying, why? Why would anyone go through that? Because he loved you. Because he became my substitute and your substitute for sin. 
Romans 5, 8, but God showed his love for us that while we were yet sinners, living in the filth and the shame of sin, Christ, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the great I Am, died on the cross to free us from the bondage of sin. Oh, that's just about enough. Put me over the edge. What about you? But I want to tell you, the suffering went further than that. He, he suffered spiritually. When he died on the cross, he died for all the sins of the world. Listen to his cry of agony in Matthew 27, <coughs> verse 46. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For a brief moment of time, God had to turn his back on his son because God has to turn his back on sin. And Jesus was all alone as he hung there on the cross. The Lamb of God, the great I Am, the bread of life, the great shepherd, at that moment became my substitute and your substitute on the cross. He loved you and I that much that he died for our sins. But number three, God revealed his love to us through the satisfying provision of the cross. Look back at our text again, for Christ suffered also once, <clears throat> underline that word, once for sin. That word once means satisfying. He once and for all suffered. It is over. It is finished. The righteousness of God is completely satisfied through the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. He will never, never, never again face the cross. When he bowed his head that day and said, it is finished. Church, it is done. It is finished. It is complete. He gave his life as a substitute, as a sacrificial lamb on Calvary's cross for our sins. But the last one, the final thing, God showed his love through the saving power of the cross. It brings us back to our text. For the just became just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. The reason is for Calvary that you and I may have an opportunity to come to God. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For when we were enemies of the cross, we have been reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his death. If you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this. There's a lot of false prophecy in the world. Amen. Can I encourage you, church? Don't listen to what's on social media. Get off of YouTube. Quit listening to these people who are going to lead you astray. Because my Bible, I believe in the authority of God. It is the inerrant word of God. Infallible. I believe there's no errors in the word of God. The Bible clearly says, not the Nazarene denomination, not the Methodist denomination, not the Baptist denomination, not the Presbyterian. The Bible... The Bible says there's only one way to get to heaven. Amen. And if you want to get to heaven, my friends, this is the only, only, only way that you can get there. Right. Amen. And here it is, as clear as it can be, nothing added to it, nothing taken away from it. Jesus said, I am the way. Amen. Amen. I am the truth and the life. He says no one, no one, no one comes to the Father except by me. Amen. Amen. If there would have been any other way, God would have done it. But Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the great I Am, the great Shepherd, the bread of life, the giver of eternal life, Jesus, the one who loved us, He died on the cross 
so that you and I can have eternal life. Now, some people may disagree with me, but that's okay. I, I'm sure I'll get a lot of disagreements when I get home anyways. But um, I believe salvation is always a miracle of God. Amen. It's a transformation power of God falling upon us. If you're saved today, you're a miracle by the divine power of God. You are lost in your punishment and guilt and shame of sin in Jesus. <laughs> he reached down because he loved you. And he says, because of my son, I'm going to pick you up out of sin. And I'm going to bring you over and I'm going to plant your feet on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I pray today that defines your life. But maybe it doesn't. And I just wonder today, how many here have a mind say, well, I'm only 30, and I'm only 40, and I'm 50, I'm only 60. I still have 30, 40, 50 years to get this right with God. And I lie on the pits of hell. James says, what is your life? He said, I'm going to smoke. I mean, I don't know where 61 years went. Gone. Life. Here one moment and gone the next. Today may be the only day, your last chance, your opportunity for salvation. Look, salvation is not hard. It's not hard. The Bible says, first of all, you just recognize you're a sinner. That's what I did one day. I said, God, I'm a sinner. And then you have to repent for them sins. God, I'm repenting. I used to live this way, I used to do this, and I used to act this way, and I used to behave this way, and I'm turning away now. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, praise God. I'm coming over here by the transforming power of God. I'm now a new creature, and I, I don't act that way, and I don't behave that way. I'm a new child of God. And then you ask Jesus Christ into your hearts and mercy. Jesus will not get you to heaven here. He'll get you to heaven here. That's the distance between heaven, y'all, here and here. And if you don't have Jesus in your heart, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. The shield is coming to play this morning. And maybe the Spirit of God is speaking to you. And you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And God is tugging at your heart. Why don't you make that decision today? Come and give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. It will be the greatest decision that you will ever make. Maybe today you're here and you're just not where God wants you to be. And you just want to come and say, God, just help me to get in the center of your will to be all that you call me to be. Or maybe today you just want to come and say, God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was my substitute. Thank you that he died in my place upon the cross. Whatever it be, be obedient to the Spirit of God. You step out and you come as you place.